What's up guys? This is part two of Ryan Graves' brief on UAP tactics. So really what were these crazy UAPs doing off the east coast of the US back in 2014? This is his briefing from the AIAA, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics back in August of 2021. In this briefing, Ryan goes through what they saw out there, what the UAPs look like, and more interesting for me is how they were acting, what they were doing. If you haven't seen part one of this video, go ahead and check that out that goes through the first half of his briefing this is part two these are the tactics how these things are actually moving how they're operating and gives a lot more detail than what we're just considering by looking at one little video on the internet and arguing about it hope you like the content please smash that like button it helps the algorithm subscribe for future notifications of my videos i release uap videos every friday 1500 gmt if you want to support the channel further go to patreon.com forward slash chris lado to support the channel love patrons thank you guys for being here in any manner chris lado Welcome to Lado Files. He estimated 15 and 30 feet. Uh, again, very difficult to make estimates, especially when it's a you know a split second um, near miss like that. We did, uh, of course, have continued visual encounters after that. People going out, taking a look, um, but it's very difficult to see them. Um, we would have them on the radar. We'd have them on the FLIR, our uh, joint helmet mounted queuing system, which is pumping all this information onto our visor. Uh, and also tracking your head movements is showing us exactly where to look uh, for the object as we're coming to emerge with him. And we do this all the time. We train to this. This is not an abnormal thing to come to emerge with an aircraft um, for us. So uh, as we come to these merges, this thing that we do all the time, we're highly trained at for dogfighting, it was a hard time seeing him. We couldn't see him. So uh, many of us will go out. Uh, we'd zip by, try to slow down. Uh, we couldn't see them. Uh, sometimes maybe it would appear like they would descend a little bit, um, which unfortunately kind of indicates our ability to see them if they just kind of drop below the um, the belly of our aircraft that was flipping over inverted, which I'm sh sure some did, but um, we are also making sure we don't hit these things out there. So we are giving them a pretty healthy buffer. So that's very interesting to me, okay? So we talk about the systems. He has all of the jet systems on this thing, tracking it, okay? The radar, the targeting pod, and the helmet mounted cuit system is gonna put a little square over, over that target exactly where it is for the engagement, okay? And they find when they get there, these things move. Something moves out of the way, they can't see it, they can't engage it, or they just can't make out anything in there. Meanwhile, if they're not locked onto it, okay? If they're not targeting it, it goes right through the formation. Okay, so what does that tell me? The tactically, that tells me that when these things are targeted, Okay, when they know something's targeting them, okay, we, we should know if something's targeting us as a fighter, right? We have radar warning receivers. These things seem to actually kind of know when they're being targeted because it splits the formation. I think it's kind of, we surprised it, okay? It didn't realize that we were coming there, uh, but when you target it and you try and engage and you point at these things, it looks like they're quite elusive, okay? They get out of the way. So to me, that's some sort of awareness. So uh, take that for what you will as far as a visual acuity thing, uh, but you know, our box and our sensors are showing us one piece of the sky. Um, so what's the difference between this first, uh, you know, near miss and the second one where it's hard to, to, to see them? I don't know. Uh, right now, now we're kind of getting a little uh, uh, ticked off in the squadron because for us, our first inclination that this is some type of classified drone program that we're not aware of and someone is testing it where they should not be uh, and something needs to be done because we're going to take out an aircraft uh, with possibly two souls on it. So. A lot of people say this is a classified drone program, okay? But they are pissed off about this because now they're putting their lives at risk, okay? If you're at the entry point, I mean, that is crazy. Everyone has to go through the entry point. So putting something there means you're putting, you're actively putting people at risk. So they're mad about it. They want to find out. I'm sure they put up some questions and they're not happy about it, okay? Although this report is primarily submitted for tracking purposes, it is only a matter of time before this results in a mid-air collision in Whiskey 72. That's from the commanding officer of their squadron. Okay, I mean, that's a pretty big statement. It's only a matter of time before this results in a mid-air collision in Whiskey 72. So they're not happy about it, and they're submitting safety reports to try and fix it. Next stage, they go down to Jacksonville, okay? They're preparing for a deployment for Operation Inherit Resolve aboard the USS Roosevelt. They continued to encounter the objects. This is in Jacksonville. And so they were aware of this foreign intelligence, okay? Like I mentioned, Chinese, Russian uh, fishing boats off the coast, again, it's international waters. The objects showed themselves to be present in the Jacksonville areas when they arrived. So they, they fly into the airspace there. Guess what? Objects are still there. 
And now let's hear about where the gimbal, this is where the gimbal video actually comes place. He doesn't say those words. I appreciate that. Uh, this is where we get this video. Listen to this. Um, while returning from one of our flights, uh, an air to air flight, a relatively large, maybe, uh, maybe eight aircraft. Uh, I was in a flight with, um, I believe it was three other aircraft. We went out to conduct our mission, uh, as the missions are ending and people start uh, coming home due to, uh, being low on gas, it's typically one aircraft at a time. We don't just all come back at the same time. Uh, one of the one of the aircraft I was flying with uh, picked up a radar contact uh, and flew over a bit on their way home to investigate. Once they landed, they brief, debriefed, showed the tape that I'll talk about here in a second. Uh, but the image they captured uh, is what you see on the screen here. <laughs> I love it. Says the image you capture is what you see on the screen here. Yeah, I think uh, if you're watching this video, you've probably seen that video before, okay, called the gimbal video. But now, really interesting, what I want to show here is the tactics, okay? Tactics are very important, you know, that's why they're classified. That's why they're not releasing a bunch of information. That's why they redact all these things, okay? If you know how our tactics, now you can make tactics to counter them in an actual war or engagement. So here, let's talk about the actual tactics. He goes through and talks through it here. I think it's extremely interesting. All right. So what was happening outside of the, the small clip that um, folks may have seen already. So on the situational awareness page is kind of where all our data is getting pumped into. Um, and we typically look at that to receive offboard information or even our own uh, onboard information in order to identify targets or all the stuff that we do up there. Um, so what was interesting was that um, on our situational awareness page, what we noticed was that there, there was a, and I use the word formation here, there's a formation of about four to five aircraft flying in what resembled uh, a wedge formation. And as they were flying along, they began a turn that had some type of radius of turn, right? So it wasn't an instantaneous direction change. It turned as if it was cutting through the air. Uh, and they were a bit jumbled, right? So they didn't maintain perfect formation. They kind of scattered out, almost looked semi-random. Uh, and they were at uh, separate altitudes as well, uh, but not, so they weren't at the exact same altitude. To me, that sounds exactly like the orbs flying in a V formation. You look at Phoenix lights. How many times have we seen these kind of strange colored lights, okay, weird orbs or something, orange, yellow, red, flying in, in a V formation? If you get up close to them, guess what they look like? It looks like a square inside of a sphere, okay? What's interesting to me is, they're flying in this V formation with the gimbal object, okay, behind it, okay? But they're different. He, as he notes here, they fly differently. You can tell how aircraft fly. You feel it after a while. You can see, you can sense the timing, et cetera. So he notices here they're flying the actual five orbs, I would call them, in a, in a V formation, kind of jumbled, right? Almost like they're flying together uh, in some loose formation, but they follow a certain path. And you'll see the gimbal object does something different. As they rolled back out, they basically did a 180 and started flowing in the other direction. Um, the object, the gimbal object from the image before uh, is represented in this slide by the circle with the, the line going through it. Uh, and this object was proceeding behind the larger group. And essentially it approached and then it stopped for a bit. And then as the formation turned back 180 degrees, it basically turned, it basically just right, it's, it just stopped from that position and then immediately went in the opposite direction, more or less, so that there was really no radius of turn, uh, as I was highlighting uh, on the, the formation. So that's great. That's an advanced maneuver, okay? We can't do that. You can't have something flying through the air that we know how it works, right? An airplane that uses lift and thrust and then just stop like that. I mean, you can do it with a helicopter, right? It won't be going 250 knots at that altitude, for one thing, is my guess. And then it just, when it just stops and then reverts back, that's not how planes work. You have at least a mile of radius at 250 knots. I mean, even the A-10 who has a small radius is going to show up some sort of radius of curvature on the radars on the, on the SA page. Okay. So that is, that's an advanced maneuver right there. Um, you see it. So that's a tactic. Okay. The, the orbs themselves, the five in the formation, they're flying along normally. Okay. They fly the gimbal stops. And then when it comes back, the gimbal goes with them again, flying behind them. This made me think of the video on, on the Nimitz, okay? When they said that there was one witness, so Trevor said that there was a flying saucer there or some other object, some different shaped object, and it was interacting with these Tic Tacs or maybe the Tic Tacs were coming down to it or something crazy like that. So is this something related? Is it something similar? Why is the, why are there two different uh, objects there? There's definitely two different types of tactics.
this was intended to just be a quick talk about this. Uh, I would like to get more into um, the safety conversation here uh, as we continue forward, but I think it's very important that people understand that this is a very pragmatic thing for me. This is not, you know, I'm not a UFO guy. Uh, this is this is all very new for me. My concern is the fact that we are almost hitting <laughs> something that's out in our working areas uh, with very expensive aircraft uh, and with people uh, at risk here. So that's it. I mean, you heard it from, from Ryan Graves. He's not a UFO guy. He's doing this for safety reasons. Okay. If you have a crazy, insane object splitting your formation and seeing them on a daily basis, flying you around, you're seeing them with multiple sensors, there's obviously something there, guys. Okay. It's, there's obviously something there. And that, that's what he's highlighted. Thanks so much to Ryan Graves for, for highlighting this stuff. So I think tactics are important. What do you guys think? I mean, this is a lot of data. Okay. Yeah. It's coming from just a few sources, but you have multiple witnesses talking about multiple contacts, multiple sources of information. We have the Range Fowler corroborating information in 2019. I mean, it really seems like something's going on, on the East Coast and this looks like kind of what their tactic. So what do you guys think? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for being here. Thanks for watching. Appreciate your support hugely. Smash that like button. If you did like this type of video, subscribe. You get future notification of my videos. If you click that little bell button. You can support the channel on patreon.com forward slash Chris Lato. Patrons have really made this possible and greatly improved the editing of the video. If you haven't noticed that lately, that is from patron funds, really just making the product as, as good as we can possibly make it. So thank you for that. Go to patreon.com forward slash Chris Lato to support. And finally, our huge initiative, we want to bring decentralized science and point it at this problem. Okay, after 80 years, we still don't have any information. Are you serious? We have the same level of information, even with people like Ryan Graves, Lou Elizondo, Christopher Mellon, you know, I still don't even know if it can happen. Are we really going to trust the government after 80 years of not telling us anything? I think we need to do our own initiative. We need to get our own evidence and make it open source for everybody, for the good of humanity. Let's finally understand what's going on out here and we can hopefully make the world a better place for our kids, right? For the future. Have a great week, everybody. Peace.